One of the uh, one of the things that we always look forward to at this conference each year is what's going to happen next, and that is um, we are going to present the Anthony Shadid Award uh, for Journalism Ethics. Uh, and this is an award that goes back uh, uh, several years. It uh, didn't bear Anthony's name uh, originally, but since his untimely death, um, it has. Uh, in honor of him. We were hoping, we had planned, we had arranged for Nada Bakri, uh, his spouse, to be here and actually present the award this year. And she was one of the victims of the bad weather yesterday, so she was not able to get here. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, now Jack Mitchell, who's the uh, chair of the judging committee for the Shadid Award. And um, Jack, you can take over. Yeah, this is a classic bait and switch. Uh, they promise you one thing that sounded pretty good, and you get me. So, uh, this is an award that is given for the uh, outstanding efforts and good decision making in journalism ethics, and it's a matter of the process is really what we look at. Did the organization look at all the, the pluses and minuses of a particular action? Did they take time to consider the impact of what they're doing, both in seeking truth, in pursuing an important story and just relentlessly uh, going after it, but it also tempered by the responsibility for uh, making sure that the people, your, your subjects are being cared for and the impact on society that you're trying to uh, minimize harm, if you want to use the phrase uh, that is off, often thrown in here. Uh, and this time, our, we had a nice group of, of nominees this time and several finalists, but the Chicago Tribune came out uh, quite easily on the top, and for a series that they've done on the juvenile justice system in, uh, in Illinois. And it was had a high impact series. Uh, it led to the resignation of the head of the program uh, and reforms, you know, and that's real high impact journalism. And if the uh, we were giving an award just for investigative journalism, uh, they might have won. But what made it even more impressive for us was that they did outstanding investigative work that had high impact, and yet they were extremely cautious about protecting the rights and the interests of the students or the, uh, the young people who had been caught up in the system were essentially victims of the system. And they were uh, allowed then to uh, participate to the extent that they would. Uh, nothing was published that was not uh, that they were not agreeable to having published, because they were not they were the victims. They weren't the perpetrators of any injustice, and they also were uh, very careful about getting too close to the, the uh, their sources. Uh, uh, Walter Bagdanovich, uh, last, uh, last couple of days ago, there's another conference on investigative journalism. And he talked about his need to resist the temptation to hug your, the person you're interviewing. You know, this poor person is telling their personal story. Your human instinct is to hug them, but you can't if you're going to be a journalist. And we thought that the journals, uh, that the Chicago Tribune did an excellent job of keeping the distance while being sympathetic. And we say the judges found it a, a very impressive package. So I'm very pleased uh, to award the, uh, this 2015 Shadid Award to a group of four people from the Tribune, uh, David Jackson and Gary Marks and uh, Dua, uh, I'm sorry, Idib, Idib, who were the reporters on the story and Anthony Soufflé, who was the photographer. Now, uh, David 
and Anthony couldn't be here today, but we do have Dua and Gary. So I'd like to uh, present this award to them. It's a plaque and, uh, and a little cash <laughs> to uh, reflect that. So come on up. There's your plaque. You can sort this out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Actually, um, I'm David Jackson. Uh, Gary, uh, because of a family medical issue, could not make it today. Um, Anthony Shadid assisted Gary when both of them were reporting from Iraq. And uh, I speak on behalf of all of us. Gary shares our deep and very, very personal gratitude for this honor. Anthony Shadid's life stands for a simple principle. The reporter works in the public square before the watching eyes of the world, and in this high-stakes forum, every step he or she takes will become part of the story. Shadid's story is glorious and enduring because the ink in his pen seemed to flow straight from a very human heart. He was the anguished witness to endless war, and as he journeyed through holy lands and battlefields, he constantly admonished us don't turn your eyes. Look at what is happening here. Our journey took us into a hidden world of suffering and injustice, and for us, every step depended on the courage of young people who became our guides. These were mostly African-American kids, state wards with histories of searing abuse and neglect, and the predictable behavioral and psychological problems that can follow. At a cost to taxpayers, of well over $200 million per year, Illinois government agencies sent them by the thousands to live in residential treatment centers that promised skilled therapy and close supervision. Conditions inside these institutions, however, were hidden from the media and even from many government regulators by strict juvenile privacy laws. To pierce the secrecy that surrounds the most troubled facilities, we sought medical, mental health, and child welfare records from confidential sources, from adults who faced potential prosecution or the loss of their careers by providing the sensitive documents. We owe a great debt to their bravery as well. And then, through slow and often frustrating street reporting, we tracked down dozens of former facility residents, many of them runaways, some as young as 15. Together, the records and interviews revealed a staggering pattern of abuse. Hundreds of juvenile wards were assaulted and raped in Illinois residential centers every year, our reporting found. Children were routinely preyed on by hardened peers and subjected to gang violence. Kids with histories of sexual abuse were attacked again by peers and even by their adult caregivers. Child prostitution became a fact of life at the most troubled of these facilities where experienced youth introduced others to pimps, to escort websites, and to street corners. And thousands of kids fled to the streets, where some sold drugs and sex to survive, and others broke into homes and mugged passers-by. Dozens have never been found. Many of these underprivileged youth were shuttled for years from one grim institution to another before emerging more damaged than when they came in. In the end, we published on the record that counts of more than two dozen young people who had suffered violence and mistreatment in these government-monitored facilities. It was only when readers saw these young faces, heard their voices on video, and read their accounts buttressed by official records that the true horror and human cost of this broken system became clear. A movement of reform quickly spread from Illinois' capital to the halls of the Justice Department in Washington, D.C and continues to reverberate to it today. Our approach to working with youth reflects our profession's evolving recognition that reporters must deploy the highest level of sensitivity when dealing with the victims of rape and other crimes, but that these victims do not lose their First Amendment right to speak out about their experience if they so choose. These were young people whose cries for help had gone unheeded even as they were mistreated and abandoned 
while in government protective custody. They wanted to herald change and to help the thousands of other wards who were being placed in violent and chaotic facilities by court and government authorities. Still, we had to verify their accounts, gauge their capacity for consent, and assess whether they could be harmed by speaking out. When, my, when the minors had a guardian, we informed the adult of every aspect of the story. We answered every question they had, and we got their consent to conduct the interviews. In those case, cases, we typically conducted the interview with the guardian being present. In the majority of the key cases, however, there was no biological or state-appointed guardian in the picture. These young people were truly agents of their own lives. Some were staying with siblings and non-custodial relatives, with boyfriends, girlfriends, and peers, and others were literally living on the streets. In these cases, we considered several factors before deciding whether to include a youth account or quotes in the series. Even when young people were eager to cooperate, we tried to assess whether telling an individual story would stigmatize or do harm to him or her. We did not use accounts that could not be cross-checked against police, court, or child welfare records, or corroborated through separate independent interviews with witnesses and participants in the events. We examined records and interviews to determine whether any youth had impaired mental functioning. While a low IQ score or a mental health diagnosis obviously does not disqualify a person from providing their account to a newspaper or rob them of any First Amendment rights, this was an element in the newsroom discussions. And from our first encounters, we gave the youth complete power to decide whether to share their accounts and whether to do so on the record. We clearly explained the options to them. When the youth consented, we discussed their place in the story multiple times and made sure they understood the importance and the reality that when we were considered publishing. In one case, a teenager who was prostituted and gave multiple on-the-record interviews consented to photographs and video and shared with us her diary and letters she was an untrained and gifted writer who'd spent recent juvenile detention stint filling notebooks with poetry about her group homes, frequent times on the run, and life walking Chicago's toughest street. But on the eve of publication, she expressed fear of retribution from her pimp should her story be published. She had been a prominent feature in the series, but we removed her story without hesitation, and we thanked her for what she taught us. Still, in another example, we got powerful on-camera interviews with both a pimp who explained how he recruited residential runaway, runaways and one young woman whom he had prostituted. These young people presented us with sharp moral dilemmas. Some were utterly destitute and asked for basic necessities that would have been very easy to provide. A little food, a ride, help finding a lawyer or advocate, enough money for bus fare. These pleas for help arrived suddenly and powerfully. In one example, after Gary interviewed a 16-year-old residential center runaway on the streets of Rockford, she plopped her backpack down beside his car, introduced another teenage runaway, and implored Gary to let them ride with him the 90 miles back to Chicago. In that case, and all others, we decided to withhold assistance to protect our final report against any suggestion of bias. We made one small exception. When reporters were buying a soda or snack for ourselves during the course of a day, we offered to do so for these young sources, following the practice of common courtesy you might find among neighbors. In the example of the Rockford Runaways, Gary called me to discuss the situation while the girls waited. Both of us talked to the youth, explaining why Gary could not give them a ride to Chicago and advising them to go to the police if they felt in danger. Saying no to these pleas was a painful part of the reporting. By doing so, we risked cutting off cooperation, losing sources, and story subjects. But when we explained why we couldn't help, respect for this project among these young people only seemed to increase. They saw that the newspaper was interested solely in the truth, wherever it lay. Even before the third day of this five-part series had been published in December, lawmakers, senators, and other officials were taking immediate steps to protect wards housed in Illinois' 50 residential facilities and begin a systematic overhaul of the state's mental health programs in ways that could better the lives of thousands of children for years to come. But most of all, 
young people saw how much good flowed from their words, from their brave voices, from them simply speaking out. Quote, nobody but you guys listen to us, story subject Angelique Borden wrote on Facebook. Quote, finally we are being heard, added Miss Whitney Holt in a separate social media post. It's about time. I really help. I really hope we help them see the flaws in the system. Thank you.